Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And in our ongoing tribute to Medal of Honor winners, tonight we want to take note of Sergeant Einar Engman, who died recently at the age of 85. Sergeant Engman was awarded his Medal of Honor on August 2nd, 1951 by President Truman for his service in the Korean War. He was one of the last surviving Korean War Medal of Honor winners, and he was also one of the last surviving Medal of Honor winners from the state of Wisconsin. He came from Tomahawk, Wisconsin in Lincoln County. That's north central Wisconsin. That's real Packer country up there. Here's Wisconsin Television on the death of Sergeant Einar Ingman. Some sad news to pass along about a real-life hero. His daughter says Einar Ingman has died. The Tomahawk Man was Wisconsin's last Medal of Honor winner from the Korean conflict. President Harry Truman awarded Ingman the medal for single-handedly destroying two enemy machine gun nests in 1951, in spite of the fact he had taken a shot to the face. True hero. Ingman was 85. Less than a year ago, Sergeant Ingman was honored by Lincoln County with his own postage stamp. That's small-town America up there, and they really appreciate their war heroes. Here's a television account of that event. He was willing to put himself in front of harm's way on the battlefield during the Korean War. More than 60 years later, the local Medal of Honor recipient is being honored for his heroic actions on his 85th birthday with a commemorative stamp. News Channel 7's Kevin Carr has a story that's new at 10. On February 26, 1951, Sergeant Einar Ingman single-handedly destroyed a machine gun nest with a grenade. He ran into a second one, suffering severe wounds to the face and neck, killing the entire enemy gun crew with his rifle before falling unconscious. He received the Medal of Honor for his actions. As you get older, you understand the severity of what he went through, that medal. Fast forward to 2014. Now 85-year-old Ingman of Tomahawk is one of only nine living Korean War recipients to have the medal and is among those whose photographs will be on stamps depicting the Medal of Honor. Those stamps were revealed in a special ceremony for Ingman on Monday featuring local representatives, family members, and other veterans alike. I think he's got it coming to him. If you ever read what happened, what he did, he should have two, three of them like this. Part of the dedication to Einar Ingman's sacrifices and accomplishments in the Korean War is this postage cancellation, which will expire after 30 days of use. After that, we have to destroy him. That's the way the post office works with these special cancellations. You can't keep it forever. And while he may be too humble to say it himself, it's clear from Monday's ceremony that many in the community view Ingman as an American hero. I consider him a hero because he did something voluntarily for people he didn't know to give them the opportunity to live like us. A fitting tribute to a veteran and his selfless actions in war to serve his country. The Medal of Honor is the United States' highest military honor awarded for personal acts of courage above and beyond the call of duty. Well, for those of you who don't know that much about the Korean War, let's set the stage for Sergeant Ingman's heroism. The Republic of Korea had been established in 1947 when the Soviet Union sponsored the formation of a communist government in the northern part of the Korean Peninsula. It was a national division without any historical basis. The Soviets had occupied the northern part of Korea at the end of World War II and were directed by decisions made at the Yalta and Potsdam conferences to accept the surrender of Japanese troops north of the 38th parallel. The Soviets announced that the citizens they had liberated begged them to help establish a communist government in spite of the fact that U.S. forces occupying the southern end of the peninsula were asked by no one to do this. Rather than confront the Soviet Union over this, the matter was submitted to the United Nations. In August 1947, the United Nations mandated internationally supervised elections to determine which government the people wanted. The Soviets refused to allow this to happen, and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea was born. That's North Korea today. The Republic of Korea in the South was established almost by default. Since that time, a country that had never been divided became two antagonistic halves. The Soviets assisted the North in building a strong and powerfully equipped army, while the United States aided the South in establishing a much more lightly armed defense force. Through the remainder of the 1940s, the two Korean governments accused each other of violating the border, as well as agitating within each other's countries. North Korean dictator Kim Il-sung traveled to Moscow to confer with Soviet leader Joseph Stalin in January 1950. Stalin promised military aid to Kim for an invasion of the South. Stalin, who was in possession of American nuclear weapon secrets that were stolen by the Rosenbergs, Klaus Fuchs, 
and others, which we've talked about in some of our podcasts, was no longer deterred by American nuclear weapons. With this in mind, he gave the go-ahead to an invasion of South Korea, which began on the 25th of June, 1950, which resulted in quick North Korean victories and pushed the South Koreans and the residual American force from Japan and some UN troops almost back to the sea. This prompted a response from the United States and the United Nations. Here's a Pathé report on the beginning of the Korean War. On June the 25th, 1950, the President of the United States, Harry Truman, broke off his summer holiday to meet his Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, for crisis talks in Washington. At the same time, an emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council was addressed by its Secretary General. This is a serious one and is a threat to international peace. I consider it the clear duty of the Security Council to take steps necessary to re-establish peace in that area. Korea is a small country, thousands of miles away. But what is happening there is important to every American. On Sunday, June 25th, communist forces attacked the Republic of Korea. Free nations must be on their guard more than ever before against this kind of sneak attack. As the B-52s began to bomb North Korean positions in the south, it was clear that for the first time the Western Allies were on a collision course with the communist bloc. The United Nations had passed a resolution condemning the North Korean attack as an act of aggression and called on them to withdraw to the 38th parallel. It was also clear that they were going to do no such thing. So the scene was set for a war between North and South, with the North supplied by China with tacit backing from the Soviet Union, and the South supported by the United States and its allies, and sanctioned by the United Nations. With American and United Nations forces backed up, the first counteroffensive took place in September of 1950, and it was directed by General Douglas MacArthur. It was a surprise amphibious landing at the port city of Incheon near Seoul. It was a total surprise to the North Koreans who did not believe an amphibious landing was possible. The landing placed U.S. forces in the rear of the North Korean army, and allowed the assault force to drive eastward across the peninsula, isolating the communists in the south and cutting them off from their bases in the north. It was a huge tactical success, but it was a strategic failure because with the North Koreans routed, it served to bring the communist Chinese and their overwhelming manpower into the struggle. In the winter of 1950, the communist Chinese launched another offensive, which again drove American and United Nations forces back. At this point, in January of 1951, the United States and UN forces launched their second counteroffensive, this time against primarily Chinese Communist troops, and it was led by General Matthew Ridgway. And this is where Sergeant Ingman comes in. Then Corporal Ingman was a member of the 17th Infantry Regiment, 7th Infantry Division. On February 21, 1951, the major thrust of the continuing UN offensive became known as Operation Killer. For the next two weeks, four U.S. Army divisions plus the 1st Marine Division pushed to drive communist Chinese forces north of the Han River. No single unit experienced any extraordinary casualty count in this operation, but the pace of the losses was still significant. It is unquestionably due in large measure to the valiant exploits of Corporal Ingman, but the death count on February 26, 1951 was so low. Here is the Congressional Medal of Honor Society website on Corporal Ingman's actions that day. Sergeant Ingman... A member of Company E distinguished himself by conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty in action against the enemy. The two leading squads of the assault platoon of his company while attacking a strongly fortified ridge held by the enemy were pinned down by withering fire and both squad leaders and several men were wounded. Corporal Engman assumed command, reorganized and combined the two squads, then moved from one position to another, designating fields of fire and giving advice and encouragement to the men. Locating an enemy machine gun position that was raking his men with devastating fire, he charged it alone, threw a grenade into the position, and killed the remaining crew with rifle fire. Another enemy machine gun opened fire approximately 15 yards away and inflicted additional casualties to the group and stopped the attack. When Corporal Ingman charged the second position, he was hit by grenade fragments and a hail of fire which seriously wounded him about the face and neck and knocked him to the ground. With incredible courage and stamina, he arose instantly and, using only his rifle, killed the entire gun crew before falling unconscious from his wounds. As a result of the singular action by Corporal Ingman, the defense of the enemy was broken 
his squad secured its objective and more than 100 hostile troops abandoned their weapons and fled in disorganized retreat. Corporal Ingman's indomitable courage, extraordinary heroism, and superb leadership reflect the highest credit on himself and are in keeping with the esteemed traditions of the infantry and the U.S. Army. Ridgway's counteroffensive was successful in driving the Chinese communists back across the Han River, and the Allies were able to retake Seoul. Within a couple of months, Ridgway replaced MacArthur as the commander-in-chief in Korea. President Truman relieved MacArthur of command. He had challenged Truman's orders once too often. And until an armistice was signed two years later, there was a rough military stalemate at the 38th parallel, which is where all the fighting began in the first place and which remains today. The Chinese and the North Koreans lost nearly a million men. The Allies lost over 300,000, of which almost 200,000 were South Korean troops, and over 100,000 were American troops. But fewer Americans died in February of 1951 on that fortified ridge near Maltari in South Korea because of the heroism and bravery of Sergeant Einar Ingman. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps, and Sergeant Einar Ingman, you have our eternal gratitude. We cannot begin to repay what we owe you. <laughs> <laughs>